Hey, good day, it's Prezzo. Thanks for joining me in the workshop today. I hope you're doing well. Now, the hashtag ShopMadeTools has been around a bit just recently, and just the other day I was watching a video by this guy, uh, Just One Guy Metalworks, and in that video he was showing a couple of tools that he had made in his own home shop. And in the comments I sort of posed a rhetorical question. I said, how many tools does it take to make a shop made tool? And the answer often is a lot. So unless it's a very simple tool, you're going to need some equipment and some tools and some materials to make that shop made tool. And I guess the question then is why would you bother? Why don't you just go out and buy something that will do the job? And that sort of led me to think about why do we make our own hot homemade tools? And sometimes it's because uh, you don't have the budget to go out and buy something off the shelf that will do the job and sometimes it's because you want a custom variety of that same tool. So for example, something you might buy uh, from a catalogue uh, won't necessarily fit the machine that you have or doesn't have the capacity that you need at the price that you can afford to pay. So I'm going to head over to the bench in a minute. We're going to look at a couple of tools that I made and we're going to explore the reasons why I did that rather than just buying something off the shelf. And as a hobbyist, I don't have a budget to go out and buy a lot of very expensive gear. So often I have to make do or make something that will do the job. So let's go and have a look. Well, the first of these tools is an ER32 collet chuck that's designed to go on the spindle of my Colchester lathe. Now Colchester has a number five Morse taper in the spindle. And you might say, well, why don't you just go and get a a normal collet chuck like this one here. This is an ER40 and it's got a number three Morse taper and that's an adapter that goes from number three to number five. And I've used that in the lathe before and it does a good job. The only problem is that it takes a draw bar. So when the draw bar is inserted in this end of the uh, collet chuck, it means you can't pass long stock through the center of the chuck itself. So you're sort of limited to stock that's about that long. And as you see shortly, this particular chuck is designed for another accessory that I already have. And in order to make it work, I've made a draw tube instead of a draw bar, which you would normally use with a collet chuck of this type. So the draw tube is just a piece of 20 millimeter nominal ball pipe, and it's got a nut on this end, and it's got uh, slots in the end of the nut there, which are exactly the same as a normal ER32 spanner. So that spanner will fit the collet nut, but it will also fit the nut on the draw tube. And uh, the reason I want to be able to do that is just simply to save on having two tools lying around the lathe when you're using this particular chuck. And the other thing you might notice is that the body of this particular chuck is about twice as long as a regular ER32 chuck. And that's so that I can get the working end, the business end, out further from the spindle. And uh, the, the reason I needed this, or I wanted it, was because I bought a Tornado freehand turning attachment to go on my Colchester. That's a, an interesting little device that you can buy here in Australia. It's made by a company called Eccentric Engineering. And it uses a flat table attached to the uh, saddle of the lathe, or the cross slide if you like. And this chuck is able to fit over the top of that table. So let's go and have a look at it on the lathe and you get an idea of why I designed this chuck to be the way it is and the draw tube. Well this is the spindle nose of the Colchester and this is the number five Morse taper in the center of the spindle. And as you can see that collet chuck will insert like that. Got the collet nut out here and here is the Tornado freehand turning attachment. Now it's basically just a flat table with a series of holes drilled in it there's a pin and you can center the turning tool, the freehand turning tool, on this slot on that pin. And then you can pivot that around or you can just simply use that freehand. Now it's, it's a really, really well designed little accessory for your lathe. And if you're doing a ornamental work uh, in uh, free cutting materials like brass and aluminium and free cutting steel, it works great. But as I said, the problem is that you need to be able to get this table underneath the chuck. Now it turns out an ER32 is the largest diameter chuck that you can use comfortably with this table. And the ER40 chuck that I already have clashes with the table and the end of the turning tool, this foot here. 
So that's why I needed ER32. And you can see that I can get that tip of the tool right up against the face of the collet chuck quite easily. So that works great. And this extra length that I've got here in the body of the collet chuck means that I don't have to work right to the very end of the ways on the bed of the lathe. Uh, because my lathe is old, uh, when I get that close to the end of the bed, it sort of tightens up and it's a bit hard to move around. So, yep, ER32 is great. Now, the other thing you might be saying, well, you know, why do you need a draw tube? And the answer to that is that I can pass a long piece of stock like this right down through the center of the chuck and still be able to anchor the chuck in the spindle. So when I tighten up that draw tube, it locks that positively in the spindle and there's no chance that's going to walk out as you're doing any turning. So let's have a look at the other end. Well, there's our draw tube nut and we just tighten that up by hand and then using exactly the same spanner we use on the collet nut, we can tighten that draw tube up. Now there's a 20 millimeter diameter hole through the center of the nut and the draw tube and the body of the chuck. So I can have up to that diameter material extending out from the spindle if I need to. So you don't have to work with short lengths, you can have the full length of stock and then make parts off that and part them off as you go. Now I doubt that I'd be able to buy anything like this off the shelf and uh, when I looked around at what was available they all had draw bars not draw tubes and that meant that if I used a draw bar I couldn't have unlimited lengths of stock in the spindle. So once again, this is why we do shop made tools is you can modify them and customize them to suit your needs and make them more versatile. Now let's go and have a look at the tool that I used to position this part so I could cut these six slots around the end of the nut. Now you can see there are six slots that make up that feature around the end of the nut. And you might just say, why don't you just get one of these hex collet blocks, put that in the milling machine and use that to position it while you cut those six slots. And this is an ER40 uh, collet block, and that's the biggest ER40 collet that you can get. That's 26 diameter, and as you can see, it's not quite big enough. So there was no way I was able to uh, pass that full assembly through the collet and then hold that in the, the milling machine vise. Not with the collet in there anyway. And even if I didn't have the draw tube assembled into the nut, you still are faced with the problem of how do you hold that large diameter in that collet block there. So you've either got to make an arbor or a spigot or something and that's just an extra step. So I needed another way and luckily I already had a solution that I had made myself. So let's have a look. All right, this gadget here is a spin indexer or a spin dexer. You can buy these on eBay and they're great. Uh, they allow you to do 360 divisions at one degree intervals and it has the capability of taking 5C collets. Now I don't own any 5C collets but I have got ER40 collets and I was able to buy off the shelf an ER40 collet chuck with a 5C spigot. So that allows me to hold parts that are sort of oddball sizes. So with uh, 5C collets they usually come in 1mm or 132nd intervals and if you've got some weird size they don't easily fit into those, uh, those collets. But uh, with ER40, you can hold any diameter from 3 millimeters up to 26 in uh, any variation of size. So that's great. Now, the only thing is, once again, how do I hold that particular part in this uh, ER40 collet chuck? And as we've already seen, my biggest collet doesn't allow that tube to pass through. So that wasn't going to work, but this does. So this is my interpretation of what a spin indexer can be made to look like in the home shop. So let's have a close up look at this one. Now I've made this about five years ago and at the time I didn't have a huge budget for buying tools. And even though that spin indexer is not that expensive, I decided to make one myself because this has a number of advantages over the spin indexer. The main one being that it has this rather chunky three jaw chuck on it and it has a big enough uh, capacity in the spindle to take that particular pipe and I can grip that part in the three jaw chuck and then position the part to do the features that I needed. So it's got that extra capacity. Now the body of this is made of an aluminium casting uh, so is the base plate that's a separate casting and it's got a 4140 spindle machined uh, and it runs directly in the bore of this aluminium casting here. Now you might say, well that's bad, but it's not like we're rotating this at very high speed. 
it's just got to be a close fit and there's got to be some means of locking it. Now the division is done with this large collar on the end of the spindle and it has a row of 40 holes and a row of 36. And that allows you to do most of the common divisions that you would need for most homemade parts. So let's have a look at the individual pieces that make up this assembly and then we'll look at how the division is done. Now there's all the parts disassembled, sorry about the oil on everything. <laughs> um, and as you can see, this is uh, actually two parts here. So the body of the indexer is mounted on a separate base plate. There are four socket head screws holding the two together. And there's a couple of dowel pins as well to make sure that there's accurate alignment if you ever need to take it apart. Now I did it that way because at the time I had a different milling machine to what I have now. And I realized that you know if you change out different machines, you may need different patterns of slots in the base here. As it turns out, this doesn't fit my bridge port, but I can fit two uh, T-nuts or T-bolts in this side here, and I've just got to use two strap clamps on the other side. But at some point in the future, I could swap out this base for one that's specifically designed for the bridge port. So this is all cast aluminium, now including the base, but that could be made from solid stock if you need to. And if you're looking at this and saying, well, I don't have a home foundry, well, you can actually manufacture that as a welded assembly. So uh, this section here, the base and this section and this section could all be welded up from solid stock and then you could do all your machining after you've done the welding. Now I sort of did that when I made the spindle. So this cylindrical part here is separate from the back plate for the chuck. I rough machined all of these parts and then I MIG welded the shaft to the back plate. And once I'd done that I was able to do all my finishing machining and avoid any distortion that might happen with the welding process. Now there's a very fine thread on here, I think it's about a 1mm, one, yeah, one 1.5 millimeter pitch thread and there's a retaining nut which is split and it's held in place with a single socket head screw. So that allows you to take up any end play in the spindle when you do the, the final assembly and it can still rotate freely but with no lateral play in the spindle itself. Now this is the, the bit that does all the uh, indexing. So this is a solid piece of, I think, stainless steel. Can't quite be sure. No, this is actually 4140 with a hard chrome coating. And on the two rows of holes, it's marked on the end there. So this is the, the 40. And uh, I've marked the major intervals, 5, 10, 15 and so on. And on this side I've got 36 divisions and I've numbered those all individually because they would fit basically. And you can see there the, the holes drilled in the, the outside circumference of that particular part. And what we have then is a, a spigot or a pin that drops into each of those holes and that locks it quite tightly. But there's also a separate clamp that fits in the base of the casting. So this is just one of those split cotters and you can tighten the whole assembly up with that little ratchet lever. So uh, let's get it back together again and uh, let's have a quick rundown on how you would use it, although it should be fairly obvious. Right, well there it is back together again and uh, the idea is that you would just simply rotate this sleeve here and using the pointer you can work out the number of divisions that you want to uh, move that through and when you get to the appropriate place you drop the pin into the appropriate hole. Now for extra security you can tighten up that clamp there and that locks everything enough to do most machining operations that you want to do. And uh, with the the divisions that I've got here with 40 and 36 you can get most of the common divisions you would need so using the two rows of holes you can get 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 18 and you know variations on that. Uh, so 40 and 36 holes gives you most of the divisions you would need for most home projects. 
Now, I guess you'd be saying, well, that's great, but how would you drill these rows of holes if you don't already own an indexing head? Now, as it turns out, I've actually got an indexing head that I could use, and I didn't own the spin indexer at this point. But if you didn't own those things, how would you do it? Well, most 3D printers these days will allow you to print a disk with the appropriate number of holes in it to a fairly high degree of accuracy. So if it was me, I would uh, print a disc, which is around about 200 millimeters diameter, and it would have a hole in the center that would suit that spigot there, or some other sort of um, uh, spigot or mandrel that you had made. And then I would attach that plastic disc to this piece of stock here, and then using a finger or a pin, I could index around and drill those holes and you would get a fairly high degree of accuracy. It's not tool room quality, but it would do the job. Now, I've also seen people do clever things with uh, printed paper patterns that are printed on a laser printer and will have radial lines coming from a central point and using an optical or a digital microscope, you can position that part and drill the row of holes. So, you know, if it's a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds out, it's not a deal breaker. It would work for most home pro projects. So that's, uh, that's my version of the spin indexer. And like I said, this came about because of a need that I had for a particular project. And none of the devices that I had or that I could think about getting would do the job that I needed. But this does, it didn't cost me a lot. The total cost was just the cost of the chuck and also the fuel, I suppose, for making the aluminum casting. So there you go, that's a couple of shop made tools that I've made and uh, the whole point of this video was to demonstrate that sometimes you need to be able to make your own tools, not because you're cheap, it's because you can customize them to suit your needs. Now in my case with this ER32 collet chuck, uh, Eccentric Engineering sell a version of this, and it's a very good one, but it's not designed for a Colchester lathe. So my only option was to make my own, or cobble together something from commercially available parts. But like I said, this has the advantage that I can pass the stock right through the center of the chuck. So for me, that's a win. And this little piece of kit here, uh, that once again was done because at the time I didn't have the budget to buy a spin indexer but also it has that big advantage of being able to pass large diameter parts right through the center of the spindle. So for me that's a win. And although I've got a, another indexing head, it's a little Hercus one, it's a beautiful little tool, but it doesn't have that capacity to pass the long parts right through the center of the bore. So once again, that's that fulfilled a need that I had uh, and uh, there was nothing that I could afford to buy on the budget I had to do that job. So that's it for today's video. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, I'm going to see you soon. I've got two interesting videos coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, they're going to be a lot of fun. So it's Prozo signing out for now. Thanks for joining me today and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.